I'm actually going to be joined right now on the phone by the Reverend Dr. William Barber. Uh, obviously, he has done so much uh, trying to see some changes here in the United States. And Dr. Barber, are, are you here with us? I am. Hi, how are you doing today? Thank you so, Thanks much. so much for calling in. I, uh, well, you know, this is an incredible day in the Poor People's Campaign. We tiered text and, and contacted over 2.3 million poor and low wealth voters to get involved and to vote for an agenda of uplift. We have a historic, not only in a white man and a black woman with um, Indian descent being elected uh, to the presidency and vice presidency, but they ran openly talking about raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour in the union, which would have impact 49 million poor and low wealth people of every race, creed, and color. They talked openly about expanding health care. They talked openly about dealing with institutional racism and systemic racism from voters of uh, uh, suppression to, to um, <clears throat> injustices in police brutality and, and among immigrant people and brown people. I mean, you think about that, and they won everywhere, in the West, in the, in the, in the middle part of the country, in the Northeast, and in the South. That is a huge reality. It is showing us that there has been this, this illusion that extremism can control uh, the whole country, in particular the South. The fact is, if we run and be honest on these serious issues to, to promise uplift for the poor and low wealth people, there can be fundamental transformation. And that is something I hope that people don't miss. You know, um, there's a hymn in the church that says, uh, uh, plant my feet on higher ground. We've been in a situation where we've had a president see, that was hostile to uh, love uh, 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 and more concerned about hate. It was hostile to meanness uh, and less concerned about mercy. It literally was hostile to uh, justice and more concerned about injustice. We have a chance now to turn that. And as Biden and Harris have hugged people, it, their mandate now is to hug those poor and lower people who are being hurt the most during COVID, who are being hurt before COVID, but to hug them with policies of uplift. And if those policies lift up poor and low-wealth people, regardless of their color, their creed, their sexuality, the millions of them right here in North Carolina, that would in fact heal the nation. The healing of the nation will come through the healing of the body, and the healing of the body of America is going to come by saying to the 140 million poor and low-wealth people, you no longer will be excluded from the decisions in this country. At Reverend Bird, we've heard so much about will the black voters show up this time around in the election cycle and how important they would be. I, I want to talk about Georgia and where we see Georgia right now, um, which has been a historically very Republican state. And uh, we've heard concerns about not enough black voters actually being able to get out to the polls. What, 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 are, what are you seeing in this election cycle? Well, you know, there's been this plan ever since 68. It was called positive polarization. Buchanan, Kevin Phillips, and Nixon put it in place to deliberately divide the country for political expediency, to exploit the division, and to do it along the issues of race. And we've seen it operate for some 52 years now. People like my good friend Stacey Abram, people here in North Carolina with the Moral Monday Movement, the Forward Together Movement, we said that doesn't have to be. And so we've organized for years to bring poor and low and, and uh, poor, um, black people and white people together around the agenda. What, remember now, what we see in Georgia is two, is, is a, is a two phenomena. We see uh, this higher turnout of the African-American vote, but we also are seeing a turnout of the progressive white vote. Mm -hmm. These states from Maryland, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Texas, historically have been low voter turnout states with high voter suppression. What, what's, what's breaking through now is that the turnout is higher, the volume is higher, and you're seeing the fusion alliances of black people and progressive white people and Latinos coming together uh, to change the dynamic of the electorate. And this is just the front end of it. This is just the front end of it. Because even though we will say we probably will have 75% of eligible uh, voters to uh, have voted this time, that still doesn't lift up the number of people who could have been registered. 
when the southern states vote their full strength and we back we push back voter suppression, you're gonna see a fundamental shift all over this country. And I think literally it's it's starting now. It started in North Carolina in two oh eight with President Obama. Uh, it's, it's in North Carolina now when you've seen, even though Trump may win North Carolina, we don't know yet, but look at what's happening with the lower ticket, the governor, and so forth and so on. I think in the next two years, you're going to see massive shifts in states that were, were, were deemed Republican or red states, but they really are not red states as much as they were low voter turnout states, high voter suppression states. Uh, we're, we're going to break through the solid South the solid South and its illusions is just about over, and you're going to see fundamental change all across the South. And Georgia, what you've seen in Georgia, what you've seen in North Carolina, are just the front end and the tip of what's going to be happening. And, and just finally, I wanted to ask you about this. Listen, we've seen so much division in our country, and it's really been playing out uh, this year. We, we've seen the calls for social justice. We've seen the calls for racial equality. But then we watch this election cycle, and as these results are coming in, we see exactly how divided our nation is, how, how split votes have been, uh, um, how different of an opinion folks have about the direction that our country should go in. So for President-elect uh, Biden and for Kamala Harris, what do you see as their mission as far as moving this country forward? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Yes, Donald Trump has exploited the divisions. He did not create them. He and his marauding band of politicians have chosen exploitation and division and with, uh, to couple that with their lust for power. Uh, they have been brutal and mean. Uh, it's not just been Trump from McConnell all the way through. I mean, they've embraced that. Tom Tillis embraced it. Uh, Bergen embraced it. Our own state legislature embraced it. But the first healing is when the people speak, this is the largest election, number of people voting in the history of this country. And it's still not the full strength. But over 70-some million, probably we end up near the 80 million people say, this is not what we want. This is not what we want. So that's the first step of healing. When people are mean, you have to remove them from their power so that they may be mean but and divisive, but they can't use power to continue. The second thing that must happen now, you have a mandate when you get 270, you are president of these United States. And he's won the presidency by, uh, uh, with the electoral college and the popular vote. Healing will take place when we see policies that address the people and the people are able to say, wait a minute, meanness doesn't get you anything. So 62% of, of people want a hot living wages. Healing will come when Biden and Harris push for that and push it through. Most of the nation wants health care attached to their body and not their job. When they heal the body of the body of the country, the soul will be healed as well. So it was, the healing comes through them now embracing policies that will lift and heal poor and low wealth people regardless of their color. If you do that, guess what? If you lift from the bottom, you actually help everybody. Everybody gets help. They don't need to get in a back and forth and, and, the, and the constant bickering and the argument. It's time to settle in now, especially in the middle of COVID. And one of the things I said to President-elect Biden when we did a podcast uh, during Easter, I said to him, the hope is in the morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. If you hear the mourning of the people and answer their mourning with concrete policy, that lift people up, that, that, that acknowledge people, that changes their lives, that's what brings healing. When they see that what you get with racism and ugliness and grief and lust for power, that's all you get. That's all they have to offer. But over here, you will get truth, justice, love, and policies of transformation. When people see that, they will choose to have the truth, the love, the justice, and the positive transformation rather than the lies, the meanness, and the racism. They will make the choice. That's where the healing will come. So now it's time to get to work. I was watching as Biden was hugging somebody, a little kid that had some disabilities. He and Harris must now hug the people of this nation with policies of transformation that lift their lives and change their lives. And I guarantee you, when you do that, 
it will produce healing. We can't stop anybody from being divisive. Some people are going to be divisive no matter what. That's a part of this democracy that's been with us from the beginning. But the, what people have said, we want healing. We want to address poverty and address health care and address this pandemic. And we want to address systemic racism. As they do that, the majority of the country will go with them and there'll be a mighty healing in the nation. Well, the Reverend Dr. William Bar Barber, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much and God bless you.